And welcome back to our luncheon highlight uh, of our joint Moody's, PIE, and CG conference on the Multilateral Development Bank's Room for More. Uh, we've had two very, I think, informative and intense sessions uh, with a lot of issues raised on governance, on China, on lending capacity, on specifics of ratings, on the role of the MDBs, on the potential demand for infrastructure. And rather than going back to that, we're going to broaden it still further. I am delighted that my colleague Simon Johnson has agreed to give today's keynote on the topic of, I want to make sure I get the words right, uh, global economic rules for the 21st century. Is that right? I knew the content. I just couldn't get the phrase right. Um, Simon Johnson, as all of you know, is a senior fellow here, but also, and in some sense primarily, of course, is the Roland A. Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship at MIT Sloan School. Simon is one of the world's most cited economists and creative, particularly on the issues of development, but also more recently on financial regulation and justice issues related to that. Uh, Simon was Director of Research and Economic Counselor at the IMF prior to joining the Institute. Since then, he has become something of a rock star with his uh, fantastic 13 Bankers, uh, written with James Kwok in their subsequent book, White House Burning on the U.S. Fiscal Issues. Uh, he and James continue to put out the baseline scenario, one of the world's leading economic policy blogs, and Simon remains a very influential advisor in domestic debates, um, including as a member of the FDIC Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee and uh, the Private Sector Systemic Risk Council founded by former FDIC Chair Sheila Baer. Uh, he and I are together on the Congressional Budget Office's panel of economic advisors. And he, in addition, I don't know how he has time to do everything, but he does. He joined the Financial Research Advisory Committee of the U.S. Treasury's Office of Financial Research. I know from my colleagues and our mutual friends at MIT that he's an outstanding citizen and teacher there. He remains a very actively engaged and outstanding member of our community here. And he remains someone who is extremely articulate forceful and far-sighted in thinking about the global financial architecture and now occasionally linking it to trade issues as seen in his recent op-ed that we're featuring today on the website about U.S. leadership. So Simon is going to take our discussion of multilateral development banks and embed that in the broader debate over the U.S. role of China's rise in international governance I am delighted to have him with us today, and then uh, Ann Van Prag, our colleague from Moody's, will chair the Q&A on the record following Simon's remarks. Simon, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Adam, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. My topic is Global Economic Rules, the rules that govern how the global economy works today, and most importantly, and I think most interestingly, the rules that will affect how the global economy develops in the decades to come. Specifically, I'd like to talk with you about three relatively straightforward questions. First of all, which global rules matter now and for the foreseeable future? I'm going to argue there are some important rules currently being formulated. Um, and, and hopefully we can discuss that further. Secondly, as my, as my uh, friends and former colleagues from the IMF like to say, who holds the pen? Who's uh, in charge of, who has the initiative? Who frames the issues? Who does the drafting of, of these new rules? And, and thirdly, what exactly is the process through which these rules emerge? What should you be looking for? Is it some sort of big deal, a large conference or a series of conferences, or is it a much more um, uh, subtle and incremental uh, process? The main issue, though, I have to say that, that fascinates me is, is the one that uh, you've been grappling with uh, directly and indirectly all morning, which is U.S. leadership in the world and, and um, the effect of the rise of China on, on that leadership. Does the emergence of the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, for example, challenge the United States? Does it mean that global leadership has perhaps already shifted away from the United States? Does the U.S. Uh, response or lack of response to the AIIB 
uh, represent a, a bigger shift in, in global power that, that we should uh, be spending more time on. Now, I, I think it is very hard or impossible to have any discussion um, of global rules without going back a little bit in history and, and talking at least for, for a few minutes about 1944 and the system that emerged after World War II. Now, I know you all know a great deal of history, so I'm going to be brief in, in this part um, of my discussion. But I think there are um, a couple of points worth making, and I, and I want to come back to those by way of comparison later on. So taking my, my three specific questions, what were the global economic rules that mattered in 1944 as the end of World War II uh, approached? Well, I think we'll agree that the most important rules were about finance, uh, specifically about international finance, how you make payments between countries, what we now call current account convertibility and, and related issues, and also, of course, how it would be possible for a country to finance imports larger than exports, finance a current account deficit in a way that was sustainable, in a way that was fair, in a way that over time uh, they would not build up unsustainable debts. Now, the context for, for thinking of, of those rules, of course, uh, was, was fairly obvious. Uh, Europe uh, and other countries needed to be rebuilt. This would require a great deal of, of capital. It would also require the ability to import uh, more than uh, exports for the foreseeable future. So on what terms could devastated economies with uncertain prospects borrow? And, and of course, the backdrop to that was, how could the world avoid a repeat of the debt default disasters and competitive devaluations experienced during the 1920s and 1930s? Who held, who held the pen in, in 1944? Well, it was the United States, I think, to, to a large degree, not the United States alone, and not the United States unilaterally imposing its will on other countries. If you go back and, 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 and look at how the ideas that became Bretton Woods, the Bretton Woods uh, Conference emerged, it was very much about a British-US interaction. It started with a conversation about how to pay for British imports of, of war supplies, and it became a discussion about exactly how the international payment system would be structured subsequently. And I have to say that, that, that Anne has pointed out, I do still have a residual British accent. I'd forgotten all about it until she told me that. Uh, but I am an American, so uh, when I say we, I mean we Americans. And I, when I say the British, I mean those other people. Uh, the British put up a good fight. And, and Lord Keynes, of course, spent a, a, a number of years, the last years of his life, actually, fighting really hard to propose alternative arrangements in which the dollar would not be as central a feature of the payment system. But ultimately, the Americans got what they wanted, an end to privileged trading arrangements within empires, or if you prefer a slightly more modern language, the establishment of the principle of non-discrimination against American goods uh, in, in Britain and throughout the British Empire, as well as obviously um, in, in, in many other countries. This was the end of sterling as a, and, and the end of the UK as a leading, the end of the sterling as, as a leading world currency and the replacement of the dollar, and it was also the, the end of, the, of, of Britain as, as, um, in, in its former role as, as a dominant uh, financial power. What was the process through which these roles emerged? It was, it was very big set-piece uh, negotiations, uh, it culminating in the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference. A lot of things had been worked out prior to that, of course, but Bretton Woods was very important. And, and Bretton Woods was certainly, at some level, an attempt to be inclusive. The Soviet Union, I, I would remind you, was at the Bretton Woods Conference, and if you look at the original Articles of Agreement, there is an allocation of quota to the Soviet Union. They chose not to participate. They didn't, decided that they didn't want to follow that route. Um, and, and countries subsequently could participate on a, I would say, mostly a, a take-it-or-leave-it basis. You could join this club or not join the club. Over time, perhaps, the rules have shifted, but, but not that much, uh, actually. Taken as a whole, this new set of global rules codified the rise of the United States as the predominant market economy in the world. Through acts of deliberate design and based on its unassailable position of the world's leading creditor, the U.S. helped its allies back on their feet, and this made a major contribution to economic recovery and growth over the decades. Um, as, this, as this is a, a lunch talk and, and, and you're all struggling to stay awake, I, I felt I should uh, bring in some quotes from Yogi Berra, the, the great 
a baseball player who, who very sadly passed away. There are a lot of Yogi Berra quotes, and, and, and I'm sure you can find better ones to fit this. Uh, but it, for the three, I have three sections of what I'm going to say today. And, and for the first section, uh, the, the decisions that were made in 1944, I, I think Yogi Berra would have said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. So they did. Now, the world has obviously changed a lot since 1944. And, you know, perhaps looking back, you, you might want to say that it's been a, it's been a great uh, success um, and perhaps an unparalleled success. But at the, at the time, and in, in, certainly in almost every decade, there have been many people who believed that the U.S. had lost its leading position as a world economic power. Um, the first time, perhaps, was in the 1950s. Remember, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1957. Many people thought this heralded the end of, of, of um, U.S. dominance in many ways. I think the U.S. Um, fairly clearly won that competition. In the 1970s, the fixed system uh, of exchange rates broke down. And, and that was extremely traumatic. And people, I think, with, with, with good reason, um, were convinced that this was the end of the dollar as the, as the center of the international payment system. It wasn't, actually. The holdings of dollars today are much greater than they were in, in, 19, in 1971. In the 1980s, Japan was widely regarded as being on the verge of overtaking the United States, in part because of superior manufacturing techniques, but also because they ran a persistent current account surplus and accumulated assets around the world. I, I was a graduate student at MIT in the 1980s, and you could attend classes. I, I didn't actually attend them. I only watched them through the window. But you could attend classes where I think you held hands and, 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 and learned um, by holding hands, I don't quite know how that worked, Japanese manufacturing techniques like just-in-time delivery and so on. These classes don't exist anymore, as far as I'm aware, uh, at MIT. And Japan is, number, Japan is number one, with no disrespect intended, including to the person who wrote the book called Japan is Number One. Um, it, it's not now an idea that, that, that I think you would take very seriously. In the 1990s, uh, the launch of the euro was considered likely to propel Europe to, to greater global prominence, Today, the European, is a center, European economy is center stage. I'm reading these words carefully. I've thought about drafting them. The European economy is center stage, but not in a good way. I, I don't mean to, to be obnoxious about this, but you can think about what's happened in Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Cyprus, or Greece repeatedly. Um, and while I'm sure that Europe will recover, and Europe remains a very important part of the world economy, the idea that, of Europe, that Europe will displace the U.S. in terms of global leadership seems like more of a stretch than it did uh, two decades ago. In recent years, of course, the discussion has been much more about China and, and the question of whether China can displace or take over some of the US role at the international level. Naturally, the discussion <clears throat> has changed a little bit in recent months away from uh, a focus on rising Chinese economic prowess towards ways in which the uh, potential disruptions in the Chinese stock market can affect US markets and, and the rest of the world. Now. China matters. Don't misunderstand me. And again, I'm, I'm not at all trying to be dis, uh, disrespectful. And I do think we should take elements of its economic policy seriously, including how the exchange rate, the renminbi, is managed. Um, my favorite book on, on China's potential for becoming a world power is Arvind Subramanian's book, Eclipse, Living in the Shadow of China's Economic Dominance, which is a best-selling Peterson Institute book published in 2011. They'll be happy to sell you one at the front desk if you don't already have one. Uh, the, the author, our very good friend, Arvid Subramanian, is now chief economic advisor to the Indian government. And hopefully they, they are listening to his well-crafted advice about how China grew through exports of manufactured goods and associated productivity improvements. China became integrated into global supply chains, producing things for companies elsewhere on a scale previously unimaginable. And Chinese managers learned how to make better products. And, and I, while, I'm, while I'm plugging Peterson Institute books, and as Nick Lardy is looking straight at me, you should also buy his book on the private sector in China. Uh, I, I, and don't believe me, believe the Economist survey that came out in mid-September. I think that it, this is a fantastic and absolutely um, compelling story. But I, I don't think, uh, and, and, and you can push back uh, after I'm done, but I really don't think China is now running or likely to soon run the, the, the world economy. And I don't think the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is a tool that will propel them to that dominant role. In 1944, perhaps it would have been a different discussion, but that, that world is, is long gone. The amount of private capital flowing to developing countries is, is much larger now, um, obviously, than it was in the 1940s. And, and the, um, the clout or the um, sway that you get from these multilateral development banks is consequentially considerably smaller. And I thought this was a nice point that came out in the, in the Moody's report, that the 
multilateral development bank lending matters a great deal for some, some countries that we should care about. It's a large part of GDP for some low to middle income countries. That's an important point. And I hadn't fully realized those details. So thank you for that in the report. But at the global level, is this a large amount of capital that really moves the political debates and, and, and helps to, to set the rules? Um, I don't think so. So the, uh, with regard to the decline, the decline of, of, uh, of U.S. dominance and, and, the, and the repeated um, reports that, uh, that the U.S. Is, is finished as global leader, I think Yogi Berra would have said, uh, it ain't over till it's over. So you don't seem to be very keen on baseball. I, perhaps we should have brought soccer metaphors or something or a more global crowd. So the, the, third, so the third point, um, the third section of what I want to say is about... Um, the U.S. And, and global rules today. What are the rules that matter for the world economy uh, looking forward? Um, and I think the, the interesting difference, to my mind, is if you look back at 1944, the U.S. really needed other countries to get on board. Uh, now, global rules obviously work better when they're adopted by more countries, but the essence of the problem in 1944 was international payments, how countries would transact with each other, at the sovereign level, how they would manage sovereign debts, and how sovereigns, creditor countries, would at the sovereign level contribute to various ways that other countries could borrow, hence the um, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, and all of the successor organizations that were built on, on, on a, with, a, with a similar motivation. But I don't think that's the issue, uh, the issue today. The issue today, uh, the issue today is, or the issues today, I think, are, are, are threefold, um, and they're all issues that fall very much uh, within the scope of action of the U.S. government, the U.S. authorities. Um, sometimes I have to uh, correct my uh, our foreign students and, and, and visiting executives um, when we, they talk about the American government. I don't think there is one American government. I think there's a number of them. But the American authorities have great sway o o over, the, over these uh, policies and over these rules. Before I get to that, though, just one point, and I think Adam had to step out, but um, you can tell him, Mark, that I agreed with him on this point, which is, what, what are we, what's the motivation? What, what, are, what do we want these rules for? How does our motivation today compare with 1944? I think it's very similar. Uh, Adam had a piece in The Economist recently debating whether or not the, we, we still want growth at, at some big world level. And, and there are arguments why you want to be careful about the, the, the nature of growth and you want to worry about the sustainability of growth. But I think we want jobs in this country. We want jobs at decent wages. There are many people who want to be lifted up. And, and that has been a major contribution of the US to the world in the post-war decades, the ability of the US to grow and to have a market that, to which other people can have access and a market to which you can sell relatively easily. But here's three, set of, three rules, three sets of rules that matter a great deal, that are currently in flux and that could potentially go, I think, um, either way in terms of being pro-growth and in terms of being a helpful contribution um, to the nature, the inclusive nature of the, of the world economy. The first set of rules is about financial regulation. But this is not finance as in 1944. This is not cross-border payments. This is about the rules for banks, the rules for financial intermediation. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think we got these very badly wrong in, in the run-up to 2008, largely because we forgot the lessons from the Great Depression of the 1930s. Please, no one get defensive. I'm not trying to point a particular finger at anyone in particular. I'm not trying to play a blame game here. But after the 1930s, the, the US adopted the principle of equal access to markets, of having a great deal of investor protection, and having a great deal of disclosure um, around uh, the way um, firms revealed information um, particularly um, to, to, to smaller investors. Strong capital markets, strong, fair, competitive capital markets were an essential part of the U.S. post-war growth. And that's not what we had in the early 2000s. That's not what mortgage-backed securities were about. And it's not how consumers were treated, including people who borrowed um, to take out a mortgage on their home. The, the bigger picture there, which... Um, 
I've written about in, in the book 13 Bankers with James Clark that Adam kindly mentioned. The bigger picture in our view is that starting in the 1930s, we deregulated many parts of the American economy. Some of that made a great deal of sense. But with regard to finance and financial services, deregulation went, went too far. There was a race to the bottom. For example, with regard to two issues I want to focus on, or at least mention. One is capital, and the second is consumer protection. On the side of, of capital, equity, how much loss-absorbing equity do you have on your balance sheet, a, an issue that, that Moody's obviously uh, cares about a great deal um, when, when, they, when they look at, uh, at borrowers? It, it is a, a matter of, of, of fact and of history that some of the largest brand-name international banks ran their businesses in the 2000s with as little as 2% loss-absorbing equity. So they had on their balance sheet, they had 98% debt and 2% equity. Well, if the value of your assets takes a hit, and I, I don't think you have to be much of a, a, a great uh, economic forecaster to um, anticipate such, such shocks in, in the future, 2% equity gets wiped out very, very easily. Uh, others, much stronger international banks that are now regarded as, 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 as having been prescient, had 3% equity. Also, not very much by way of loss absorption capacity. The system of risk weights, you know, there's plenty of blame to go around, and I'm not trying to point the finger, but the system of risk weights, which was developed on an international basis as a, perhaps not quite a rule, but, but guidance and an attempt to have convergence in, in rules across banks, the system failed completely in, in the past decade, not just once on mortgage-backed securities, but twice, where the second time would be European sovereign debt. We got the risk rates wrong. We got them wrong in the private sector. We got them wrong in the government sector. We got them absolutely wrong in the, in the academic sector. So now we have new rules. Now we have committees. Now we have um, committees within committees, and probably committees within those also. Um, and according to the very careful analytical work of Tom Hoenig, who's the vice chairman of the FDIC, who publishes this work in a private capacity, Loss-absorbing capital measured uh, correctly, uh, tangible equity relative to tangible assets, is now up to around 4% for many international banks whose names I am, I am protecting, but you can look at them on Tom's website. Now, has capital increased? Yes, from 3% to 4% for many of them. Is that a big increase? I don't think so. Um, I think that the, um, the right way to proceed, though, on, on, uh, going forward is what I hope the Federal Reserve is doing, which is to um, impose a steeper graduation of capital requirements and associated regulations so that the very large, uh, let's call them mega banks, which pose the greatest potential systemic risk to the system, face higher capital requirements, broadly construed. The regional banks in the United States, and we have a very vibrant regional banking sector, which has actually done remarkably well in the past five years, that they, they are, they're, say, between 50 billion and 500 billion in total assets or total risk exposures. Um, they're subject to uh, somewhat less by way of capital requirements. And community banks, below 50 billion or below 10 billion in total assets, um, are subject to even lower uh, capital requirements. The great thing about community banks, of course, is that they can fail. They do fail all the time. And when they fail, they do not bring down the economic system. So their shareholders and their management is very much on the line. That is, of course, not the case for, for the largest banks. So there's a lot of work to be done, and I, and I don't think it's over. And I do know very well there's enormous pushback against the system of graduated capital requirements with many arguments being made every day in Washington. And this will be a feature of the presidential campaign. I don't know how explicit it will be. Ask me again in 2017 what's going to happen, but I am, uh, on some days, cautiously optimistic that we're moving that in the, in the right direction. On consumer protection, I would just say this. You know, there's many people, including in the industry, who like to complain about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB. I see it as, as a huge potential competitive advantage of the US economy, just like the Securities and Exchange Commission was such an advantage in the 1930s. Equal protection, disclosure, a level playing field for investors was incredibly good for the development of US capital markets. There is no way that anyone with a sensible, reasonable business model should be happy that their competitors are able to rip off, deceive, mislead consumers. That's not what we allow in the non-financial sector. That's not what we allow in, in any kind of product which is relatively more transparent and all of us as consumers see through directly, including you know, the fruit you buy on a weekly basis at the grocery store. It's not acceptable and not a good way to organize the economy uh, with regard to financial products. 
Here we've made some progress. Now, there is a lot of pushback also against the CFPB, and you have to ask me again in 2017 where this is going to land. I don't know completely, but I am, again, cautiously optimistic on some days that we've made enough progress and connected with enough consumers so that it's relatively hard to, to undo that. But note that these are American decisions about the American economy and the American consumer. You don't need an international agreement on consumer protection, and we have plenty of international agreements on capital standards. You can take them or and like them or not. It doesn't matter. There's enough there as a basis on which the Federal Reserve and other regulators can now build. The second set of rules that matter uh, today are about international trade. Now, I have to admit that when I, when I joined uh, the Peterson Institute for the first time um, in, uh, I believe, 2000, uh, 2006, I didn't fully understand the way in which international trade negotiations worked. And, and I, like many people, were focused on the, uh, the multilateral trade negotiations and, and their lack of progress. But I have become convinced, in part by my colleagues, and in part because, in part because um, many of my colleagues have been involved, very involved in this process from the beginning, that, that there is underway a very important um, set of um, agreements uh, and, obviously, negotiations. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is the one that's most, most, currently, uh, most prominent currently, but also the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP, um, the potential free trade agreement between the United States and, and the European Union. These are not trade agreements of the post-war variety. They're not about reducing tariff barriers and, and eliminating quotas. They are about setting rules. They're about setting rules to some degree for trade, also to a great de degree for um, investment. The U.S. and its allies, if I can uh, use that term, are writing the rules again, and, and, and there's definitely echoes here of, of 19, 1944. But I, I, I think it's accurate to say, I, I haven't read the TPP, I'm not allowed to read it, um, but I think it, it's, it's, by all accounts, there is a great deal still to be determined in terms of how, where we end up in, with labor rights, environmental protection, um, and um, investor rights to sue government through private uh, arbitration actions. There may also be a potential... Um, changes with regard to currency manipulation. I'm a big supporter of the proposals uh, put forward by Joe Gagnon and Fred Brookston from the Institute. Um, but I have to recognize that these so far have got uh, insufficient traction within the American political sphere. So we don't know where TPP will end up. TTIP is still at a very early stage, but this is going to have a huge impact. In 20 or perhaps 30 years, there will be, I think, a large free trade and investment area stretching from the European Union through the United States and into large parts of Asia. Other countries may choose to join or not join, but that will be a, a different economy, a different set of opportunities, and, and I hope a different and better set of rules for everyone involved than what we have today. Now, that one is not 100% in the hands of the United States, but we do have a, a huge amount of say, particularly about the terms of, of TPP today. And, and if you want a, a measured and I, and I think detailed critique of, of where we are on that, I, I commend to you the views of uh, Sandy Levin, who's the Democratic, um, the uh, senior Democrat on the House Ways and Means Committee, the ranking member. The, the third issue, um, very briefly, um, that matters is perhaps the one that matters most, but also the one that, that's, that's hardest to, to pin down. And that's uh, the rules for the adoption of, of new technology. See, I think what we've learned since 1944 is that what trumps everything in the world is innovation. That's what drives growth. That's what keeps you as a leader. That's what keeps the US as a leader. The best attended talk uh, I ever went to when I was a graduate student in the 1980s at MIT was how to get a green card. It's still, I think, the best attended talk on campus every year. People want to stay here. They want to be innovative. They want to contribute. Uh, to some degree in startups, but also in established, in established uh, companies. Now, when I think about rules for adoption of new technology, I don't just think about uh, whether or not we have a favorable environment for innovation and startups. There's plenty of people who want to complain about that. I honestly don't see that in the data. It, as a place to start up a business, as a place to build a business quickly, as a place to raise capital, as a place to have an exit uh, liquidity event, if you prefer, for investors, there, there is nowhere, nowhere else comparable. 
Other places are trying, other places are rising. Berlin um, will tell you that they're making some progress. Uh, some parts of China are, are trying to, to get in on a, on a similar act. But all those roads tend to lead back to the United States, to Silicon Valley, to Boston, to other places. But in terms of rules, I, I, I would want to flag for you, uh, if, if I may, uh, just I think as an example, but also as a, as a fascinating example, and one that may link up across my other themes, um, efforts to develop the use of blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is the distributed encrypted ledger system used for Bitcoin, the digital currency, obviously a, a, a controversial and fascinating topic by itself. But the, the underlying technology of, of the blockchain is one in which transactions are verified and shared by a global network of computers. Now, this may sound like a marginal issue. It may sound like something um, peripheral, not of great interest. But um, for those of you... And for those of you who are looking for, who like to look at the, the news for markers uh, around whether we should take this sort of thing seriously, uh, I would point out that nine large banks just uh, two weeks ago announced the creation of their own consortium to support the use of blockchain technology in financial markets. This is called the R3 Blockchain Consortium. And another 13 banks uh, just joined in, in the last couple of days. Some banks are being quite public and moderately explicit about experiments they're conducting. And this is not uh, just about payments. It's not just about being able to pay people quicker or in a different way. A lot of it is about um, how you own and transfer the ownership of financial instruments. We use a lot of antiquated technology. It takes a long time to settle a payment, to settle a transaction. None of that is necessary if you build a new system from scratch. Now, what does that system look like? What are the rules that govern it? Uh, that's absolutely fascinating question. It's completely up in the air. I think the government will have less to do with this. It's much more a private sector issue. And, and there's an initiative at MIT uh, run by the um, MIT Media Lab, with which I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat connected, that is trying to um, ensure that the public interest, or at least some non-commercial interests, are represented in that conversation. The parallel is to the internet. Now, the internet, uh, you, you may or may not know how the internet works, but you use it all the time. In fact, many of you are using it right now instead of listening to me. I can see you at the back. It's the same thing with the blockchain technology. You, you don't know how that works, and you're not going to care. In five or ten years, you're going to be making payments, buying and selling real estate, transferring assets in fundamentally different ways. Better ways? Perhaps. Faster ways? Definitely. Will there be ways that are more transparent? Will there be ways which, in which, for example, systemic risk is easier to diagnose than today's uh, derivative markets? Will there be ways that are highly concentrated in the hands of a relatively few players? Or will it be a much more dispersed technology? Well, we had these issues, obviously, around the internet. We had these debates still about the internet. We will have those debates about blockchain technology. I, my preference would be to have something relatively open, relatively equal access, with relatively good protections for everyone who participates. I think, again, that's, to me, what the US learned from the 1930s, what the US applied after World War II, and, and, and what really um, helped to make this economy great. But the, the, debate, uh, the debate is on. And the, and the powerful vested interests are, of course, want to tilt the playing field this way or that way. So, um, but it's not about international. It's not about the, um, getting other people to agree with this. This is about American politics and American policy, policy decisions. So in, in conclusion, um, does the US now challenge uh, the, the United States? Sorry, does China now challenge the United States? Well, look, China, some parts of the Chinese experience have served that country uh, very well and, and serve as remarkable lessons to, to other people. And I, for one, welcome the Chinese uh, efforts to invest in other countries and, and to establish or, or comply with high standards of governance, as they said that, that, that they have. Um, we all have to care about corruption. We all have to care about weak institutions. And we all know that the dangers that those can bring. As Adam said, uh, these are many of the mistakes that we, the United States, and, 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 and those British people have made uh, over, over the decades. Um, but it's the US that leads the push for freer trade across the Pacific, and for a substantial reduction in various barriers to trade and investment between the US and, and, and Europe. The Europeans, of course, are an important part of that uh, also. I see Jacob looking at me from the back. Um, if we get these rules right, favoring ordinary citizens, this will be a major contribution to global growth and our national prosperity. We, we absolutely can get financial regulation right, and we've made some steps in the right direction, including, I would say, Dodd-Frank financial reforms. There is a powerful backlash against them, and we'll see if those re reforms withstand the backlash. 
And we have the potential to adopt a much more open trading system for securities of all kinds. That's the blockchain, if we put the right uh, architecture on it. So all of, this, all of these points matter for the global economy. They matter for um, the precise nature of growth and prosperity. And they matter for US leadership. The US may lose all of these opportunities. There is no question that that can happen. There are many creative um, people in the United States. And we do some good things, and we do some things that are less good. Um, and as Yogi Berra said, uh, ultimately, we may, well, the Yogi Berra saying that I hope won't apply to us, but it may apply is, we made too many wrong mistakes. <laughs> but there'll be our mistakes, our mistakes, the US mistakes. No, no, it's all unforced errors at this point. The opportunities are there for us. The lessons from our experience and from our history, I think, are relatively straightforward. And, and there's nobody else in the world who can take away from us or prevent us from making sensible decisions if that's what we choose to do. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everyone for sticking around. We are going to have an on-the-record Q&A, so um, we'll get set up here on our stage, and uh, I think we have about 15 to 20 minutes for that, so we hope you stick around and ask questions. Okay, Simon Johnson on the uh, fork in the road, it ain't over till it's over, and too many wrong mistakes. Um, thinking about US-China relationships, uh, balance of power here, I, I think one interesting uh, question, you ended your comments with kind of a scoring of how the US stacks up on these various measures. Will banks continue to behave? Will uh, we get the trade agreements right? And and uh, this, this new technology that I'd never heard of, blockchain technology. Um, would you walk through how you see China on each of those, those factors? And, and how, do you, um, how do you see its trajectory? I think, I think one, one thing that's an um, uh, interesting observation, uh, you know, China is in the midst of this, this rebalancing. Um, the questions still remain about the trajectory, the, how quickly this rebalancing will occur, whether it will be stop-start, how bumpy it will be. The stock market interventions this summer pointed to a more bumpy ride than a smooth ride, perhaps a detour in their efforts to bring more market-oriented reforms to, um, to uh, the economy. I think that um, there's a certain amount of impatience that, that people have and that today's media-hyped world has about how much time China is, is sort of given to, to think through this transition and this rebalancing. The um, efforts that it's making to shift its bond markets are reforms that took, in the US, they took decades. And they're being you know, pushed and, and pushed pretty quickly. Um, same with capital controls, loosening up of the capital account, um, reforms that are happening pretty quickly. So how should we think about these, these, this, these items that you laid out, and on what time frame should we, should we expect China to, to attempt these kinds of things? So uh, on, on finance, uh, obviously the Chinese financial sector has its own particular issues to work out and uh, precisely um, what the government ends up supporting and what it doesn't support is a, going to be a, a key decision that, that they have to make. But the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that the, in terms of the um, strength of the global economy and strength of the US economy and our contribution, it's about how our financial institutions um, operate. It's about the rules that govern, for example, capital and, and consumer protection. And, and there's not much China can do one way or another that affects our, our choices there. I hope they have a more stable system. I hope that they um, can sort out their, their problems without that causing uh, further uh, or any disruption to their growth. But that is a somewhat isolated, isolated decision. 
Now, on, on terms of trade, of course, the big question that my um, global trade strategist friends here think about a lot is whether China would at some point choose to join the TPP, and what would that look like? Um, and I don't think we have any strong, certainly no definitive indications on that. Those of us who think that currency manipulation or language to discourage and as much as possible prevent currency manipulation should be part of the TPP, and, and we're not winning that argument, but those of us who, who still continue to argue that, do so in part because we think that China, it's not just about China, but China um, has in the past uh, managed its currency in ways that were damaging to the global economy, damaging to the US in terms of the kinds of jobs that we lost, and, and that should be discouraged in the future, and by setting those rules in TPP, you're setting an expectation for the behavior of everyone who joins, including potentially China. Um, so we'll see if China chooses to go a different route and China chooses to build its own trade block, for example. I think, though, the TPP, particularly when you join the, the dots with the TTIP, becomes more compelling to more countries around the world. Um, on the blockchain technology, uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, the Chinese uh, do participate in that. The Chinese um, have some significant firms that contribute computing power. Um, which is a key, point, a key part of how this distributed network runs. But in terms of the debate and discussion about the structure of bl blockchain and how it's used for financial markets, this seems to be a lot about the US right now. The UK is also present in that discussion. London would like to be a center for the development of this technology. Perhaps the Europeans um, will get in on that. I, I don't think we've seen any definite signs of that yet. It is a technology that can have applications in many places, and it is a technology just like mobile phones that may confer some, if not advantage, some possibility to leapfrog. If you don't have fixed lines and you go straight to mobile phones, you can do things differently. So blockchain has substantial potential for impact in the development sphere also. But we, we don't yet see a, a, a Chinese um, influence over the structure of, that, of, the, of those marketplaces. And how about um, banking regulation? How do you see um, things developing in China? Or you want to comment on the state of the banking system? Um, do we have enough visibility into yeah. that? No, I don't want to comment on the Chinese banking system. Um, <laughs> you know, clearly, clearly, everybody who, who goes through any process of economic development has to establish resilient and robust regulation, and the, and, the, and the center of that is capital and having enough loss-absorbing capital. And I cannot hold out the United States as an as exemplary model for that in recent, in recent decades. Um, but the Chinese, the Chinese are figuring this out. You also, have to you also have to figure out, and again, the US had many problems with this, and so the Europeans. You have to figure out what is supported by the government and what is not. So if a large bank fails today in the United States, who gets what kind of protection? Um, from the Federal Reserve or from the FDIC, who suffers what kind of losses. You obviously think about that a lot at, at Moody's, and you know that it's, it's very uh, complex and, and, and evolving. The Chinese had to figure that out too. And, and it's only when you have stress situations and when um, there's political pressures to provide bailouts that you really understand what is going to be supported and what isn't. So I'm optimistic, ultimately, they, they will make some progress on that. But it's still pretty early days. Um, well, let's open it up to our audience. We've had uh, a lot of interesting, thought-provoking comments here from, from our friend. Um, perhaps people have questions at this point. Thank you very much. Um, I really liked your comparison between now and the 1940s. So as you were reviewing uh, the rule setting in the 1940s, uh, one of the things you mentioned is the US was a major international creditor and that no longer is the case today, uh, with China being you know, one of the largest international creditors in the world, um, certainly one of the largest to the US, if, the, if not the largest. Uh, do you see that still being relevant at all, being a creditor, in terms of exercising influence? Well, be being a creditor clearly matters for something. So having a large amount of uh, net reserves, for example, matters. If China. Think about the, the, how people would be discussing China today if China didn't have very much by way of reserves. In fact, there are people who are saying that the reserves they have are not sufficiently substantial. I'm, I'm, I'm not in that camp. So, so clearly it affects your individual position as a country, and that then affects your role relative to the international discussion, relative to the IMF, and so on. What, what I don't think it does is confer the kind of advantage on the global level that the U.S. had in 1944, where it was all a question of to whom will the U.S. lend and on what basis. And that was what the World Bank was about. That was what the Marshall Plan was about. The IMF was 
um, of course, a little bit more an attempt to balance between the creditors and the debtors and provide some additional balance of payments lending under some relatively short-term circumstances. Um, but it was all, it was very, the world was very much about official credit and who was able to make credit and, and to, to make a loan and who was more likely to have to borrow. I, I really don't think that a official credit, either bilateral credit or the multilateral credit that's reviewed in the Moody's report under discussion today, um, or any new forms of official sovereign lending, the sovereign as the, as, as, the, as the creditor, that that really makes so much difference or confers so much power. And, and obviously there are many people who say that the you know, large uh, Chinese holding of US treasuries confers some sort of power over the US. I, I really don't see that. Uh, I, re I really don't, do not think that that is a, anything, anything like the, the, the kind of significance that uh, it had in, in the 1940s or in the 1950s, for example. Um, at the time of the, the Suez Crisis, which is where uh, Arvin Subramanian begins his book, Eclipse. Back then, yes, official credit mattered a great deal. Um, now, now much less. Um, thank you, Simon. Domenico Lombardi from CG. Uh, I also like the way you, um, you know, described the setting for the Bretton Woods Conference at the time, how the U.S. played a uniquely proactive and inclusive role I would also like to add uh, that the intellectual leadership provided by the, the U.S. official Harris White was kind of unique in, in uh, recent financial history. Uh, however, at that time, uh, we were in a world uh, of um, uh, essentially, um, you know, dominated uh, by official flows. Right now, as you have implicitly reminded us, we are in a world dominated by private capital flows, as our friends from Moody's uh, know well. And uh, uh, clearly, we have essentially no international institutions that really have, uh, um, you know, the power of coordinating initiatives in this realm. Indeed, it's only from the 2009 that the Financial Stability Board has been uh, established. And uh, initially, it was an entity, non entity, with no legal personality. Now, it has the status of a Swiss NGO. But one of the reasons for that is that you know, it's not a treaty organization because the U.S. Congress would never pass the treaty. Uh, likewise, you know, the U.S. was very inclusive at the Bretton Woods Conference, but was all, was, at the time was the, you know, uniquely unchallenged uh, superpower. Now it is still the leading power, uh, but clearly the world has become more multipolar. Indeed, indeed, this is why we have the G20 more than the G7 or the G1. Um, so, uh, you know, I would just uh, uh, like to have your reactions, your comments on this. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because every, every time we talk about the U.S. role in a global economic governance, we are then uh, confronted by these harsh realities. And in fact, this morning, Adam was reminding us of the difficulties to get the IMF uh, uh, governance reform package <coughs> agreed by the G20 in 2010 uh, through U.S. Congress today. Thank you. So, so, Domenico, I, I think we agree on all these points. Let me, let me just sort of restate the, the thesis and, and as, as a way to check that we, to perhaps that we agree fully. So the way I would put it is um, that there is this strange combination in, in American political history and political thought. And, and, it, and it actually comes from the part of the political spectrum that's closest to the business community. On the one hand, they recognize at, at a private sector level that the global economy has been very good for them. And while the U.S. obviously had a lot of protectionism in the 19th century, that's not the policy that was pursued from the 1930s. And you, you can't find many people in the business sector who want any kind of protectionism today. At the same time, on that, that same general part of the political spectrum, which is incredibly influential consistently in the U.S., there's a lot of isolationism. So in 1944, which was three years after 1941, there, there were many people who didn't want to enter World War II, but who wanted to keep the U.S. back. And that was not an, an isolated or, or, or single moment. There had been a a lot of pressure and, and a belief in the U.S. Is, is, is needing to keep separate from European conflict for, since the beginning of the, of the Republic. So I think though those pressures are still with us. It's very disconcerting that Congress will not take up even these limited, modest IMF reforms that I think are a step in the right direction, but a small step, and don't deal with the deeper issues that you're talking about. But they won't do that. You know, to your point about the you know, lack of, you could say, lack of political foundation or lack of legitimacy or just weakness of the international institutions, I would say, yes, that, I mean, that is the territory, and it's not going to change. You're not going to have another Bretton Woods conference. You're not going to have some big uh, recapitalization of the IMF or the creation of a new institution with more powers. What you are going to have is private capital flows. 
And those private capital flows are absolutely influenced by rules. And I'm suggesting that this is not a hopeless throw up your hand situation. The rules we make in the United States can have a lot of influence over how we are impacted and, how, and our, how that affects the rest of the world. Now, how the Chinese run their financial system is, I have to say, their business completely. And, and they can either, you know, they'll learn some hard lessons just like, just like we hopefully have learned our hard lessons. Um, so I'm not trying to fix the world's problems, and I don't think an international treaty or attempting to move in that direction is, is particularly promising. But getting our own rules right, in, in the, in, at least, and, and maybe we could find more of those rules uh, to go through, that is, that is a very constructive um, opportunity. And it's one that the private sector should welcome too. I don't think anything I said is at all anti-private sector. There are some particular vested interests who would not like, I don't know, consumer protection, for example. All right, we do have to get over that, and that is a big hurdle. But despite the odds, we have made some progress on that. So I, I, I don't think I can be too pessimistic. Let me pick up on one comment that you made, because I think you were, you were really trying to get at what are the new tools, and what are the institutions, and what are the factors that make the US sort of in its position today, and, and what does the future look like there? In terms of governance, how do you think about the functioning of government? the political leadership, the, both for the US and for China, and how would you compare and contrast the two? Um, it seems like you know, this week in Washington, we were almost faced with a shutdown. That seems to be behind us now. We were looking uh, a couple of months ahead to uh, several continuing resolutions and potentially uh, running out of extraordinary measures to deal with the debt limit. Um, how do you think about governance and government um, smooth functioning of government when you're, when you're thinking about this question of future viability and leadership for the U.S.? Well, I, I think you, you put your finger, Anne, on, on the key point, which is fiscal stability and, and trying to create a, a stable environment for uh, private sector decisions. I think that's a fundamental responsibility of government. We used to be good at it in, in this country, uh, and, and I think we've lost it. It, it, is, it is incredible that um, despite the opportunities provided for us by the role of the dollar in the world economy, despite this very impressive track record we have in terms of um, our fiscal performance and being able to pay our debts, um, that, that we continue to engage in, 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 in these games that, that are fundamentally destabilizing and damaging to, to, to our economy and damaging to other people's economy too. So I, I think that is really, really um, irresponsible. And, and, and you know, I think people around the world, when they look at the US as a leader, potentially, have many good things to say about the U.S., and that there are, we have many attractive features, including it's you know, a good place to get a job, a good place to build a career, a good place to raise capital. But you know, really, this kind of action uh, at the level of our government, or that was my joke about we don't have one government, we have many governments, right? That was the re a reference there, perhaps a little too delicate. Um, I, I think it's, it's just, um, it, it's at best embarrassing, and, and it, you know, I think it does potentially damage, damage our own Damage, damage our leadership and damage our role in, 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 in the world economy. I, I don't subscribe to the view that we have paralysis in, in the US. The, clearly, the TPP is moving ahead. That's not about paralysis. Financial regulation has moved a lot in seven years. That's not paralysis. And I'm not afraid of debate. I'm not afraid of back and forth. I think that's the, the nature of the democracy. And I, I welcome every attempt to bring any of these issues into uh, the open in the presidential in, the, in the, the candidate debates we're having now for the nominations and in the presidential debates, I think that's incredibly helpful and, and constructive. Um, but I, 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 I do think that we should take this global role seriously. I think that our, and I think that the, the private sector, the business sector should be demanding of the leadership of this country not to be destabilizing. That's not good for them and it's not good for the people they employ and it's not good for the, for the world. Well, and, and, and the Chinese, I'm sure, um, have similar issues, but Let's leave it at the US. For now. Okay. I think you know, from our perspective, our position uh, on the government front is that, uh, you know, as people know, we have a AAA rating, a stable outlook on the US government. Uh, we've had periods of time where there weren't budgets passed or there were budgets passed. If our focus tends to be on the outcomes. And the irony, or the, the paradox, I guess, is that the outcomes have been pretty good. So. Growth has been better than we expected. The fiscal performance is better than we expected. The debt to GDP numbers, a common metric that we look at for leverage, has not risen as fast as we thought it would, and it's stabilized, at least for the time being. So for this 
at least next part of this decade, we see things being stable. Now, as we get later into uh, later years, into the early 2020s, we'll start to see more pressure on social spending, on um, partly due to demographics, but also just partly due to the structure of, of uh, healthcare and social security. And that will be a real test in our view about uh, whether this divisiveness that we see today is something that can that be, can become overcome to address those longer term issues. I don't know if you have thoughts on. Well, that I, look, I think you, I think you put those points very well. That there are some longer term issues and decisions to be made that are difficult, and we don't know how that's going to work through this political system. I, I absolutely agree with that, but I think the the my my, my concern and my previous answer was about the unnecessary destab potentially destabilizing short term confrontations, which may ultimately end up not damaging our credit rating, thank goodness, but certainly are not helpful to the rest of the world economy, right? Uh, spreads uh, go up sometimes when people can become worried about what's going to happen in our economy or to our government finances, and those uh, higher spreads can affect the private sector and can affect uh, sovereigns in other countries. Um, and uh, the GAO, I mean, you can argue the numbers on this, but the GAO finds that... Um, at least some of the recent uh, confrontations over debt and over government spending have the consequence of pushing up government borrowing costs, at least, you know, to some degree. Wh why is that helpful? Why, why would we want that to compound or pile on top of those longer-term difficult decisions that we have to make? Yeah, point, point taken. Let's see if there are other topics people would like to raise. Yes, go ahead. My name is Larry Greenwood. I was uh, formerly with uh, MetLife and before the uh, Asian Development Bank. Um, I guess my, you pointed out that in, mo in these three cases um, that uh, U.S. leadership uh, is, is a natural thing and uh, we should just simply do the right thing. But there are some issues that obviously we can't solve by ourselves. And, and one was it falls in the third category, introduction of technology, and that has to do with uh, cybersecurity, cyber theft, and those kinds of issues. We just, this last, this last week, saw some small progress in that area, clearly an area where without, without cooperation with China, we can't solve the problem at all, right? And so I, I just wanted to ask, is that an area where we, we, we simply need Chinese leadership? Well, that's a good point. So I, I think we need U.S. leadership, um, and we, it is, would certainly go better if we have Chinese cooperation. If the Chinese want to lead in terms of uh, reducing cybercrime, I'm all in favor, absolutely, please. <laughs> uh, if other countries want to take the lead. Um, my point was just that we, c we can and should focus on making progress on our own terms and for ourselves and try to bring other people along with us to the extent that's possible, or to the extent that they want to join in. Uh, that's, that's, that's terrific. Okay, last chance for questions. All right, thank you, Simon. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Thank you. Great conference. Thank you.